AI Mentors is brought to you by Aulis International, covering your business's staffing, consulting and networking needs. Our podcast, AI Mentors, brings you the leading minds in AI, sharing their story, their success and their advice. Focusing on fast-tracking you to the top, AI Mentors cuts through the hype to help you kickstart your data science career. You're listening to AI Mentors. I'm your host, JP Valentine. Our guest today is Deepna Devkar. Deepna is the VP of Data Science and Engineering at CNN. Deepna, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great. So, Deepna, let's start. Just give us a, a little bit of background of yourself, how you got involved in technology, some of the roles you've held along the way, and what's led you to your role here at the head of data science for CNN. Sure. Absolutely. So, um, a few years ago when I would introduce myself, I would always start off by saying, oh, my path into technology or into data science is, you know, a little bit offbeat. Uh, I transitioned from academia into industry, but now as years pass by, it seems like that is the more traditional way to go <laughs> into data science, so that's how I ended up. So I was, uh, I got my PhD in computational neuroscience. At the time, of course, I thought I would be in academia and didn't have a plan B. Um, and then um, ended up in technology through serendipity. So my PhD was in very, very different, so it was um, not about medical neuroscience, it was all about trying to understand how memory works in a normal human brain and building computational models uh, based off of theories in psychology that had existed for a very long time, like what limits our brain in terms of how much we can remember visually. So I used to do that. Uh, I also had an experimental component to, to my PhD, which is, which is where the data was collected and everything. So that's how I learned coding, statistics, data analysis, and loved that bit of it. Um, so I moved to New York for uh, doing my postdoc. So it was basically about uh, looking at what I had built behaviorally and computationally. Uh, and expanding it to studying it via imaging. So I was coming here to do my postdoc at NYU and I was going to do fMRI to actually look at the images in the brain and see like all of the research that I had done, does it actually apply to what happens in the brain um, when, when we're limited. Um, and then shortly after I started my postdoc, you know, I heard about data science and how it was taking off and how, you know, PhDs were moving into into data science and I was like, I did some soul searching and figured out that this is exactly what I love about being in academia, which is doing data analysis, drawing like conclusions or drawing insights from data. So I was like, this is great. So I started, you know, at the time I was doing MATLAB, that's what academics use typically. And so I learned Python in a few months and then I did an insight data science fellowship, which is a program for PhDs to transition into data science. Um, and I tried my luck with it, and you know, it was, it's a seven-week fel uh, fellowship, I believe, and week eight, I had a job offer, <laughs> so that was amazing. Um, that was at Viacom. But as I was there, what I realized was that, you know, while people are hiring lots of data scientists and they're like, you know, PhDs, we need PhD data scientists, not every manager is technical, and especially the companies that are just, just now building data science teams, they don't have technical managers. So you report into business executives, and that's fine, but it's sort of like it felt like we just speak past each other in different languages where they don't know how to best leverage PhD's skill set to apply to business and then vice versa. Like we didn't know coming into the business domain not knowing anything about it, like how can we help? So I noticed that niche over there and I thought I would love to fill that niche uh, where, you know, I become a technical manager, lead data science teams once I understand the business problem to actually see how you can best leverage that skill set. So that's what I wanted to do. Um, Sorry, and just to jump yeah. in because this is incredibly helpful and I think the timelines are important. Um, how long had you spent as a data scientist before you spotted this niche and decided, look, this is something I want to focus on? That's great. That's a great question. And it's kind of, uh, I, I laugh because it was very short. Yeah. <laughs> it was a year and a half before I went into managing data science teams and, uh, you know, arrived at my next role, which was a director of data science. Um, and looking back, I could have never foreseen that. It was literally, it just so happened that there was a position I was actually looking for a senior data scientist position and, you know, wanted to be an IC for much longer. Um, 
But then this position came along and I thought it might be a good opportunity. It was a very small team. It was just three data scientists. So I thought, okay, that's kind of doable because I would still get to be an IC, you know, somewhat like for some portion of my job and then the rest of it would be management. But yeah, looking back, I never, <laughs> and I don't even recommend it for people to do that because it was very stressful to transition into into that role and I can definitely dig into that. Yeah, absolutely. I just, look, you'd explained your timelines to me previously when we met and I think it's important just to jump in at that point to, to let, make people aware of, of the trajectory and what can happen when you step outside your comfort zone and, mm -hmm. and put yourself out there to take on a, a bigger role with bigger responsibilities. But yeah, please continue. So talk about your first uh, venture into leadership and then how that's, how that's evolved. Yeah, so actually I, when I went into that position, I had a job offer as a senior data scientist as well. And a friend of mine was leaving her position and she was like, hey, you know, I know you mentioned that this is something you wanna do in the future. I'm leaving, would you want to interview? Uh, and I thought, oh gosh, I, can, I can't, I can like that would be ridiculous right now. And she said, why don't you just interview and see what it's like? And I was like, okay. So I went into the interview and I was interviewed by the people that I would be managing in addition to the executives and everything who I would report into. Um, but when I met them, I was like, you know, something became clear, which was that it's a very different skill set. And that's not to say that I would recommend people, you know, jumping into management immediately when they're starting off in their career, because there's a lot of, that you can learn from experience. Uh, and I think that's important. But that being said, if an opportunity like that does come along, there's nothing wrong in trying it. Um, so stepping out of my comfort zone, that was basically like, I mean, I was managing people who had been in data science longer than I had, who had been at the company longer than I had. <laughs> and uh, that was quite fascinating. But I realized that they wanted to focus on just the technical aspects of the, of the job and didn't want to do business strategy, whereas that was something that was very, very appealing to me. Um, so I knew that that's where I could add value, but it didn't come with, you know, it wasn't a cakewalk whatsoever because, you know, um, I had to struggle with like learning and continuing to learn what are the newest technologies and tools in data science, what are the newest methodologies, what is the latest algorithm that you can apply for a problem like this. So I was kind of doing both jobs. I was spending my day, you know, doing meetings and managing and, you know, uh, coming up with the projects that the, te the team could work on all the while convincing like leadership that they needed to grow and build out the team because that, that way we can scale what we do. And then going home and brushing up on my <laughs> technical skills. So uh, it was difficult. Uh, and I guess looking back, I wouldn't just make that move right away. Um, but it's worked out so far. <laughs> yeah, it certainly has. Um, here we are now, CNN, head of leading data science. So everyone knows who CNN are, one of the most recognized brands in the world. But I think what would be great is to understand the recent changes within your department, particularly with the focus on digital transformation and um, some of the cool stuff that you and your team are working on. Yeah, I, I would love to talk about that. So uh, we are a centralized team at CNN Digital. Uh, this is the first time where I've worked on a team that is sort of uh, self-sufficient in the sense that engineering, data science, and product are all part of one team. So the team is called Data Intelligence, and we're a centralized team within CNN Digital. So none of the none of the stuff that you see on TV, none of the cool stuff that you see on TV, but we are here to transform CNN Digital. So you know when you think of CNN, it's very natural. I thought that too. You think of breaking news, you know, Trump content <laughs> everywhere, which is which is partially true for news. Uh, you know, some people say we're the tr most trusted news source. Some people say fake news, but that's that's the image of CNN, right? Um, but CNN Digital, what it was when you know when I came in, my the CTO who I report into, and you know the the all of the executives that I talk talk with, they're very much aware that. CNN Digital is simply just a web 2.0 version of what you see on TV, right? And that is, that is not something that uh, we can continue. So we need a digital transformation. We need to operate like we are a tech company and not just a journalism company. And that's where data science comes in. So that's why this team was built. 
Uh, we're very nascent. We're about seven months in, uh, seven to eight months in, I want to say. Uh, and so a, a bulk of it has been in establishing the objectives, the pillars, um, what are the operating principles that we work on, what are the projects that we're going to take on to, to solve this, um, and then just recruiting and building the team. So the work that we're doing now is basically fourfold. Um, the, at the very foundation of everything is setting up the data infrastructure and the data lake that the entire company can use. So that involves a lot of engineering. And believe it or, believe it or not, before we got here, that didn't exist. So at a media company, there's a uh, notion of using vendors a lot to outsource a lot of these things. And that's OK, because you know when you're building out data teams, they don't come cheap. So you rely on vendors to get some of your basic work done, which is which is the situation we were in. But now we're switching from that to doing a lot of things in-house. So that involves building the data lake first. So we, that was the first thing we did from scratch. Um, then the other, the other aspect that we're very much involved in is helping editorial become more data informed. So journalism is you know, the heart of our product. That is what it is. And we don't, we're not here to say, hey, AI is going to change the way we do journalism. We're not here for that. We simply want to empower them and make them more data informed so that they can, you know, use the tools and data at, at their discretion to make decisions about what they should write about, how they should write about it, and moreover, predict the success for what they're going to write about. So that's the second aspect. The third thing is... We want to become very user obsessed. So successful companies like Amazon, they're obsessed about their users. And I think the world that we live in now, we have to be. We don't have a choice because people want personalization in every aspect of their lives, starting from what their kids do to, you know, movies to like media content they watch to clothes they wear, coffee, everything. <laughs> And I think news is no different, right? So we can't assume that everybody wants Trump content everywhere. Um, some people might be interested in more evergreen content. And, um, you know, we want to be in the business of actually inspiring and empowering our users every time they come to our site. Especially with the number of data points available about the consumer and the user now, you really can do a full customization to show them exactly what they want to see, which is going to increase engagement, which is increases, you know, everyone's satisfaction with the product. Um, we will need to come back in a year's time to do another episode focused AI in action just to hear about some of the crazy things that you guys are doing here and, and, and how you're transforming CNN. Yeah. Um, but staying on topic of, of AI mentors, even from your intro, there's going to be, uh, I know people will be listening and want to know more about some of the specific challenges you faced along the way. I want to touch on two in particular that I'm interested in learning more about, which is um, your transition from academia to industry then stepping into a, a new leadership role and then working with C-suite executives to gain the trust and engagement. So, yeah, if you could t speak to us first and foremost about the early challenges transitioning from your PhD into industry uh, and we can go from there. Yeah, sure. So I would say I'm, I'm very thankful for insight from, you know, helping me transition from academia into industry because it's, it's funny, like it hasn't been that long. It was probably about five years ago that I made the transition. Um, and at that time, the mentality, even in New York, like even though we were, you know, following the Silicon Valley model and, you know, driving PhDs into data science, but some of the industries, especially media, was just not ready for PhDs, you know. So that transition, uh, I, I got the job offer, but I would say once I started the job, it wasn't easy to actually transition into that because industry is very, very different than academia. You don't have an infinite amount of time to think about a problem, you know. And so um, that transition was definitely challenging, but I would say that uh, that was exactly the thing I hated about being in academia. Like things were very slow, impact didn't come very quickly. Um, and the impact was basically papers, and I actually wanted to see something in action. So all of that was very uh, appealing to me. So um, I made the switch very quickly, but I know that now, you know, actually having PhDs on my teams uh, that I've managed, uh, that is often the, the toughest transition to make, to, you know, be more agile, function in an iterative way, 
rather than you know trying to optimize optimize to perfection <laughs> how can one prepare for that because there's going to be inevitably PhDs who actually enjoy the, the paper writing uh, but yet still have the appetite to move into industry what can they do or what should they be aware of that are going to be the biggest pitfalls and how can they navigate through through that particularly the first year yeah that's an excellent question and I want to say now data science as a field is becoming way more mature and way more sophisticated whereas I felt like in the beginning every job role had the same exact like qualification same exact responsibilities and they were just looking for this unicorn data scientist that can do everything from like visualization exploratory analysis to machine learning to building products to doing some engineering all of it right and now it's actually getting um, it's way a more compartmentalized. Than a person, yeah. yeah, exactly. So I would say for to answer your question, the kind of a PhD who likes that aspect of academic research and doesn't want to operate in this like quick iterative fashion, there are roles for that as well. Um, for example, Facebook, Google, um, even Amazon, they're, they're really investing in sort of like these um, research positions where you're literally doing research, even Two Sigma is, is one yeah. of them, uh, where you're strictly doing machine learning research where it's actually necessary to keep up with the papers and do the research on, your, on yourself. But I would say a bulk of the positions, I would say 80%, 80, 80 to 90% are basically positions where you can, you can get by um, just fine by using out-of-the-box models and you don't need that custom research. So the aspect there is to just basically understand the business problem, do the data cleaning, munging, all of that uh, necessary stuff, exploratory analysis, and then get to um, you know, the, the, the first version. Yeah. Finished is better learning. than perfect. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, next, next point is y your first uh, step into leadership. You know, um, what what was the biggest challenge that you faced, and uh, you know, for somebody else who's facing a similar challenge in the near future, what can what can they be aware of to 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 do as as well as possible? Yeah, so I'm not sure how unique my experience is than when other people go into leadership, but I at least at the companies that I was at, um, it was very much you you go from this environment where everybody around you is a PhD, so it doesn't matter. Your PhD doesn't really matter. No one calls you a doctor. No one cares about your PhD. You are like you're just in the company of PhDs. But when I moved into industry and started talking with these executives, they really rely on your intuition and your guidance to make business decisions. Now, I know I've talked to friends who face the other problem where, you know, the executives just don't get it or uh, they don't really listen to the advice that the data teams give, which is counterintuitive because they've spent so much money to build, to build that team. Um, but at least my experience was great where people, you know, really relied on me to give them guidance. And that was overwhelming because I'm like, you are see something, oh, of this company and how can you ask me what to do about this business decision? Am I going to be right? Like, because obviously with data, you have access to limited variables, right? Uh, and you, you always sort of second guess yourself if this is something that, <laughs> that is the right business decision. So that was, that was really hard to embrace. Um, but then, you know, I mean, that's why we're here. That is exactly our job. So we should be informing business decisions with the data that we have access to. So you, look, you're the, the development of your own path and, and how you've progressed shows that you've, you've made a lot more right decisions than wrong. Um, but looking back now and knowing what you do, um, is there anything you would do different if you were to start over again? Yeah, I would say at least for <clears throat> junior people, um, I would say that, I mean, there, it's, it's much easier to connect the dots looking back, right? But um, the truth is that I was always ambitious. I always knew that I wanted to do something, you know, big for my career and whatever it was. But the whatever it was changed so many times and I'm an obsessive planner. So I'm like, how did this happen? How did I not <laughs> plan this? Went from wanting to becoming a medical doctor to becoming a professor to then going into data science and now managing data science. So it's, I, I would say it's much easier to connect the dots looking back. And what I would do differently is just sort of let it be. Uh, I spent too many years in during my PhD just like obsessing over what it would be that I would do, what would be the plan B. And so I suffered through many years of like job insecurity and 
um, and self-doubt and all of those things. And I feel like, especially now, the way that industry is moving, there are all of these job options that are popping up that didn't exist when you were an undergrad. And so for junior people, I would say, be open to that change and it's okay. It's okay if life doesn't turn out to be like what you had planned. Cause I think a lot of what has become successful with me is in embracing that change with calculated risks, but in embracing that change and opportunity. I think it's incredibly important advice and I hope that people listening really, you know, focus on that. Um, switching direction slightly, uh, in your few years in, in data science leadership, you've hired quite a number of people. So you've tripled the team at Dot Dash and in the seven months here at CNN, we've grown the team to how, how large? 40. 40, okay. So you know a thing or two about <laughs> hiring good talent and building good teams. So. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about your experience from first growing your team to how you've built such a large group here in, in such a short space of time? What do you look for? What advice can you offer to candidates at interview and managers how to build a, a successful data science team? Yeah, so the first step is actually convincing leadership that you need this and you need this investment and they can trust in that investment. So a lot of it is actually road mapping, like getting into a new business that you've just joined and really understanding what are the problems to solve here. Uh, how can data actually help solve those problems? And um, you know, how do you convince leadership that you know, in a, in a uh, media industry that's suffering quite a bit due to various factors, like how do you say, make this initial investment because it will pay dividends later on. So a lot of it is that in the beginning, you know, understanding the business, understanding the problems, and then coming up with ways of solving those problems using data, and then like determining what do you need? Do you need engineers? Do you need architects? Do you need data scientists? What do you need? Um, so a lot of it is that. Um, then it's basically, you know, hiring good talent is very, very difficult for, for machine learning and, and engineering these days, because they're very hot in demand. Um, and it's hard to convince people, you know, in, in, in New York City where you have all of these great companies and, um, you know, that are doing really awesome work and then you're saying, hey, but we have opportunity as well and CNN Digital is also very data focused and things like that. So um, I've relied a lot on my network, previous positions I've had, people I've worked with before, I basically add, reach out to them and things like that. Um, but I would say like traditional ways of recruiting doesn't exactly work for data science because you really have to have the eye for technical talent, which recruiters are, you know, getting better and better at. Uh, but you do have to help them uh, navigate that space because everybody will put the jargon that's on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, so I interview process is very important, how you structure that interview process to you know, pick the right people that are actually just speaking the jargon versus people who actually know what they're doing. Uh, and the way we've done that is basically for a couple of my teams that I've led, we set up a procedure where they come in and do a case study. So either we give them a data challenge and they come and present it, or um, we say that, you know, if they don't have enough time or something like that or don't want to do a data challenge, which, which is becoming a thing, by the way, um, then we just say, okay, present a project that you've worked on before and we get to ask questions about it. So it's, you know, the technical skills, but it's also testing that critical thinking muscle that's super important. Um, because it's not just about the technical skills, trust me. <laughs> oh, believe me, I know. And we, you and I spoke about this uh, off air. Um, the bulk of my time is spent sifting through candidates' jargon and, and seeing do they understand the impact they have on a mm -hmm. business and what they're doing. And that's a good indicator of somebody's uh, awareness and their talent. Focusing then on the, the, the hiring, um, if you're speaking to somebody who is coming out of a boot camp or coming out of academia, what are the, the, the main things they can focus on to help them advance their career early on, particularly in their first role, which may be, you know, an analyst role or business intelligence where they're aspiring to get into, you know, critical edge data science, but they've got to, they've got to take a step towards it. So what are the main things an individual can work on to help them along the way? Yeah, that's a great question. One of the favorite questions that I get from junior people who are non-PhDs, uh, I speak in academia a lot as well, like what can PhDs do to transition into industry? And that question is very different than like someone who's like 
I want to do data science, but now every job requirement that I see requires a PhD. Should I go get my PhD? And the answer is absolutely no. <laughs> Please do not do a PhD if you already know what you want to do. Unless it's something like machine learning where the scenario I mentioned, like, you know, they want to go into a very research-based position or like really go heavy into machine learning, then that's helpful. Uh, but otherwise, it's not. So I think one way to transition for non-PhDs is to simply do a master's program or even do lots of online classes to gain the technical skills. But unfortunately, the best way to build those skills is through experience. So, you know, get into a business analyst role, even though that is not something that, you know, you aspire to do in the future, and then transition into more data science. Because one of the key factors that PhDs bring to the table right now um, that is very useful is that critical thinking muscle because for better or for worse they've spent years thinking about data and working through data so they know how to ask the right questions with the data so I think it's important to build that muscle of like here's a data set I don't it's it's easy to just you know uh, apply any model from scikit-learn out of the box to just you know figure out what it spits out but the the critical thing here is to ask the right questions about that data, do the right feature engineering, and then see like what it comes out with. Yeah, I think that's incredibly helpful. Yeah. Um, okay, so to, to wrap up, I, I want to finish on, on bringing it back to yourself. What do you love most about your role now, and what are you most excited about uh, over the next few years for, for CNN Digital? Um, I love lots of things about my job right now. Uh, first of all, we are in, you know, just from a business domain perspective, too, I'm passionate about journalism, passionate about news, uh, the environment that we live in. So this is sort of like my chance of really working at that. Make an uh, impact Make as an well. impact, yeah. yeah so I, I love that aspect of it. Um, and then from a technical perspective, I feel like this is the first time I've been at a team where engineering, data science, architecture, product, all of, all of those critical pieces for data teams is like in in one organization um, typically I've worked at you know where product will be different engineering will be different so one of the biggest struggles is like aligning everybody's roadmaps to get the thing you want to do and get it pushed out because these are interdependent things you know and this is the first time where you know our senior leadership has structured it this way I can't take credit for it it was already structured when I came and it's very unique and it's really fun um, because, you know, you have this end-to-end -end opportunity of building data products. So that's something that's really exciting for me. Yeah, definitely. I mean, exciting times ahead. I can't wait to come back uh, and hear how things have developed in, in, the, in the coming months. Deepna, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Get the Aldous Advantage. Become a member of the Aldous community and enjoy some of the following. AI meetups. Once a month, our community gathers to listen to some of the leading experts in the world of data science and AI. Our speakers come from all over the world, including Dublin, Boston and Frankfurt. We also have our AI mentors. Our experts will provide mentoring to all the members. And don't forget our AI in Action podcast. Each week, we have guests from all over the world talking us through their education, career and more. Become an Aldous member and get the Aldous advantage. For more information and to sign up for our newsletter, log on to www.aldous.com. That's www.aldus.com. Aldus International, empowering through AI.